So thank you all for joining this meetup. And uh, I will do a short introduction and I'll give it away uh, to Martin quickly. They're gonna be talking about smart factories and specifically how low code is making a difference there. They're gonna be sharing some use cases. They're gonna go into demos and showing you how things are actually being built. So we've got four guest speakers tonight. And I'd like to invite uh, Martin to tell us more about the use cases and uh, to introduce the speakers from time series to us. So enjoy. Thank you, Jan. I will start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen, Jan? Yeah, looks good. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, one slide better. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Bors. I'm a Medics consultant at Time Series and also an Index MVP. And I will be your meetup host tonight together with, uh, with Jan. Um, and together with me are some of my colleagues who I asked to present something really cool. Uh, first up is Martijn van Kuik, he's sales manager at Time Series. We've got Dennis van der Waal, who's a senior Java engineer and team lead uh, of big data at Time Series, really a big data hero. And we've got Rick Boss, which is customer success manager. And he's really, really, really the manager who worth this. Something about Mendix, he knows everything about Mendix. So we've got a really good lineup. Uh, and what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about transforming the manufacturing industry. Of course, with the acquiring of Mendix by Siemens, uh, the, the focus of, uh, of low code might go a little bit into the, into a little bit more into the manufacturing uh, with, with IoT, big data, Stuff like that, and we as time series also really have a good opinion on on the manufacturing in industry and the digital transformation there. Uh, so we thought about doing the the meetup about transforming the manufacturing industry. So what's the agenda? Well, first off, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of an introduction, uh, and then we're going into the future of smart factories with Martin Kuyk. Um, he's He's got a, a nice new theory about smart factory and, uh, and transforming the manufacturing industries. Uh, after that, we're gonna, uh, Dennis on the wall is gonna talk about uh, from data to, to just in time information within smart factories. He's gonna talk about challenges within the Asian landscape. Uh, and then Rick Boss is gonna take over and he's gonna uh, convert the uh, just in time information story into what it means for Mendix uh, solutions and Mendix applications. Uh, and it's gonna show you some examples of, of challenges that, uh, that can be overcome with, uh, with Mendix. So altogether, I think a really, really nice lineup. Uh, yeah, with that, I want to give the word to Martijn and let's, let's dive into the first presentation. Thank you, Marta. I'm gonna share my screen so we can dive into it. Can see my screen now, I think. Yeah, we can. Great. Well, yeah, as Marta said, um, we have a new a theory and I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, as we see it, the next goal of digital transformation for organizations to achieve just-in-time information. And it's all about moving from isolated systems to information that supports decision-making. And of course, this sounds really abstract and strategical, and, and it also is a bit, but I'm gonna make it really practical uh, because I really think that uh, this can be important in your uh, work as a consultant. I've been a medical consultant as well. And what I really liked about my job as a medical consultant is to discover the question behind the question. It will really help uh, the organizations to add value. And I think this theory can also really help you as a medical consultant with that. So uh, I'm going to start a, a bit uh, strategic and then I'm going, going to be much more uh, practical for you guys. So first, where does this theory come from? It comes from Toyota. They uh, invented the just-in-time uh, theory. Uh, and as a result, you, all, and you have now all these factories with, uh, which can produce so many cars in a lean way. And uh, at, at the right bottom, you see Taichi Ono. And he is one of the founders of Just-in-Time. And I want to show you a video clip of him 
and about the history of uh, just in time and how this was um, discovered and invented. Toyota knows how to make cars. It does it so well, it became the first company to produce more than 10 million a year. Its success is rooted in a special system and began what's now known as lean manufacturing, an ethos emulated by companies around the world to make products faster, cheaper and better. Here's how Toyota changed the way we make things. Following the Second World War, Japan was left in a precarious economic position. Steel and other metals are scarce. Already disadvantaged by lacking natural resources, materials were hard to come by and companies had to be creative to compete. Toyota's founder, Sakichi Toyoda, had started a loom business, but it was his son Kichiro who founded the motor company in 1937. They were used to working within narrow margins, as the shortage of materials increased during the war the number of headlamps on its Model K truck was reduced to one, and it only had brakes on one of the axles. The turning point for Toyota's production system would come in the early 50s, when Kichiro's cousin Eiji would travel to the US with a veteran loom machinist, Taichi Ono. They visited Ford's River Rouge plant in Michigan, and were impressed by the scale of the operation, but knew that in cash-strapped Japan, companies didn't have the resources for such a system. Having months worth of stock sitting in a warehouse would tie up precious capital they didn't have. Instead, what truly impressed Ono was a visit to a supermarket, a Piggly Wiggly according to legend. Japan didn't really have self-service stores at this point and he was struck by the way customers could choose exactly what they wanted, when they wanted. He decided to model his production line on a similar idea. With the supermarket formula, only enough parts were produced in the first phase to replace what was used in the second, and so on. This is where the just-in-time system really took shape. So that just to give you a bit of a history about uh, the theory where it all uh, originated from. It's called the Toyota production system, and that included just-in-time, but as well Jidoka which is a method for uh, identifying issues in production factories really, really fast. And on the right top, you can see this image of this person who is uh, pulling on this rope. And everyone in the whole factory of Toyota had a rope above their heads to pull uh, when there was something wrong. So that was uh, Chitoka to make sure that there were no mistakes. And just in time was all about making only what is needed, when is needed, and in the amount needed. And with these concepts, Concepts, uh, Toyota was able to produce vehicles quickly and efficient, high, in high quality standards, and according to the customer individual requirements. Now, what um, this theory is focused at is at the tangible logistical processes. And what we see now at time series is that our customers um, are, are applying uh, just in time information, which is really focused on the digital uh, processes, the digital processes in the factory. So it's all about the right information at the right moment to the right person. And uh, it's about the ideal state because as just in time, it was focused at the ideal state in a factory to be really optimal with your um, supply, with your inventory, with um, your suppliers arriving at the factory and uh, doing everything in the most lean way. GT, just in time information, is also focused at the most ideal situation of you in the factory. And we have to find four pillars to uh, focus at if you want to achieve just-in-time information. And those pillars are smart, open, integrated, and personal. And smart is all about using the latest technical advancements to optimally support the business. Open is about involving all the stakeholders of the organization. Integrated is about integrating back-end systems uh, and making information more accessible. And personal is about making the information personal and as relevant as possible to you at your uh, step in the process. So a bit fake, I, I'm, I might guess, but I'm gonna make it practical with an example. So let, let's say you have, uh, you're a maintenance engineer and you want to replace a part of a machine. You have to update multiple complex systems like PLM, WMS, ERP systems, and after you have done your work. And you have to do this while you're working on paper files uh, to, to keep up with the administration. 
So this is this is a case that, that we have seen at, at multiple of our customers. I have built an application like this as well with Mendix. And so what, what am I trying to do with just-in-time information is, is think again about these types of cases. How can you optimize this um, to the most ideal situation? Is And if you look at smart, you could work, instead of working on paper, you could work with an intuitive offline mobile application. Uh, open is, does not really apply here, but you could provide reports to regulators about compliance to ISO standards or provide performance insight to customers. And for instance, integrated would be about integrating the backend systems so that the mechanic only has one interface, only the mobile application and in the backend, the PLM, WMS and ERP system are updated so that your mechanic can work really productive. And in the end, it also has to be personal because um, that also makes the application more valuable, less error prone and more productive. So what you could, for instance, think about, there's a, there's a big difference in uh, experience level of maintenance engineers on the production floor. So you could even make instructions based on experience level. So now really applying this to, uh, to Mendix, but could, does this mean to you as a Mendix consultant or, or how could you apply this? Uh, so let's start with a customer has a request, a request that you might have like on, on a daily basis, they want a button to send an email to their customer. Then, of course, the, the um, job for you as a consultant is to discover the actual request, the, behind, the question behind the question. So what do they want? Is perhaps an update to the customer with a weekly report and scheduled event. And what we are saying now with just-in-time information is think again. What is the full business process at the customer? And then you might think, hey, it's not just internal, it's also external. What is the end goal in mind? It's a happy customer. So what should be the best solution knowing all, everything that you know as a uh, medics consultant, uh, what would be then the most ideal solution? So looking at smarts, you could, for instance, think again about a mobile app, an offline mobile app with IoT data of, of, of assets of the customer and, and update them with that with those information, it could be open. So um, you could add uh, valuable uh, information to other stakeholders, like in a customer portal. You could It could be integrated. So for instance, you could integrate with an ERP PLM system to add contextualized information. And uh, you, have to, you could make it more uh, personalized. So you could just show uh, the relevant information to the user at that moment. So for instance, information about just breakdown. Perhaps they don't want a weekly report about everything that is going well, but they just want to see breakdowns. So as a medical consultant, I would really um, say focus at, uh, for instance, if you think about smart, know everything, what is latest new and new in the Medix app store, so that you really know what's going on and, and how you can uh, provide the best um, solution to your customer. And don't think that your customer knows all this, you know, to you, perhaps this makes sense that you can integrate with every system with Mendix, that you can just add other uh, users to your application and show them really specific data and make it personalized. I'm each day I'm in, in, in conversations with customers and then I'm surprised about what I have to explain about what is possible. So really think with them about what is the best solution, think big and uh, um, yeah, add value to your customers like this. So I hope this makes sense to you. If you have any questions, then we can talk about it later on. Now I want to give the floor to Dennis. All right, hello everyone. Let me get set up. You guys are over there. That's why I'm looking over there. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, there we go. Let's go. And then we have, uh, where are you at? You were here. Yeah, that should do it. Okay, so I think we're set up and you guys are over there. All right, so uh, my name is Dennis van der Waal. I am a senior Java developer over at Time Series, and I am also the team lead of the big data unit over there. And basically what we do is we build software outside of Mendix that Mendix can connect to to um, deal with all kinds of, uh, of uh, large issues, uh, big data questions, actually. Uh, I'm going to go uh, at the end, I'll show you a little bit about the numbers that we deal with. So why we call ourselves a big data unit. Um, but for now, 
uh, let's start off with uh, talking a little bit about data because there is a little bit of a way to go when you start uh, at data, um, then you go to information and then you have actionable information, which is this just in time information that uh, um, that uh, Martijn uh, is, is talking about. So we're going to start with uh, with a simple example. Um, let's say that this is a sensor and let's say we're going to read some data from this and this is what the, what the data looks like. Um, it also has a timestamp, but well, that's not relevant right now. So we just have temp is 40. This is actually what it is, just four letters, the equal sign and 40. And already, if you're looking at this, you can already start guessing, hmm, what is this uh, supposed to mean? Um, so temp is probably temperature, 40. Oh, it's probably 40 degrees, right? Um, already, we're trying to make information out of this uh, out of this data. We're enriching it with our knowledge, um, and eventually, you could put that up onto a screen. Uh, but we're not quite there yet because 40 degrees is apparently the ideal temperature. Uh, 40 degrees Celsius is the ideal temperature for a bath. 40 degrees Fahrenheit, however, is the ideal temperature for a refrigerator. And you could also look at Kelvin and that's just really, really cold. So we don't really know. Um, this happens all the time. You have to talk to the data supplier or with the customer and say, well, this is what we see. W what does it mean, right? Um, and they could tell us. So in this particular case, it was 40 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's great. Um, at this point, we've created information, right? We know it's the ideal temperature for a bath. We know that um, uh, it, uh, it's a very, very nice day to go to the beach. At least it's a better day to go to the beach than to uh, sit in home in an unair conditioned uh, room, I suppose. So that's nice. But is it really actionable? Well, you could make decisions on this, so arguably it is. Um, but what if we take this example, a thermometer, 40 degrees Celsius, that's not good. Um, if someone is administering this uh, thermostat to you and is looking at a 40 degrees Celsius and maybe you're in a, in a hospital already and they know, oh, this person has a fever, we have to do something with that, right? So that's basically what we're looking for. People uh, have a need to see some sort of data and then they want to uh, execute some kind of action upon that. All right, so uh, let's uh, let's scale this up a little bit to the uh, smart factory size. Um, so meet Alfred. Um, he's going to be my stand-in for data. Um, I don't really know how to display data, so that's that's just going to be him. And we're going to take him from the start of the journey, which is where uh, Alfred is created, and we're going to take him to just-in-time Alfred, which is uh, well, kind of I suppose a poor pawn on just-in-time information. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, some say the first step is always the hardest part. Actually, the second step is the hardest part. We'll get to, uh, to that in a bit. Uh, we have these sensors, right? So these sensors, these uh, uh, they can produce all kinds of uh, Alfreds, all kinds of data. Um, usually, however, these sensors do not communicate with us directly. Usually they, they're attached to a bigger device uh, in a factory. They're parts of machinery. Um, there's all kinds of ways that this, uh, this data uh, uh, can well, basically come together. And usually when we're talking about a factory setting, uh, there's this, uh, these things called PLCs, which is a programmable logic controller. And basically the way you can look at one of these is, is, is like it's Mendex, but for a man manufacturing process, it's uh, what you can do with it is program the manufacturing pro uh, process into these machines. But these machines uh, also connect to all the manufacturing equipment and can also read sensor data from these machines. And usually they also have options to send this data onward. So often when you talk uh, to people that uh, work in some kind of assembly line and you want some data from them, they will tell you, oh, this is the PLC, we have to configure it in some, some way. That's uh, also beyond my knowledge. But uh, uh, so you, you try to help each other out, uh, find uh, common ground there. Um, Another way that data is sent, it doesn't always go through these PLCs. Um, uh, sometimes the sensors do indeed send information. Uh, another good example is this RFID reader. Um, and uh, these RFID readers often connect basically to the internet and the database or whatever you're sending it to directly. So this is also a thing that you can find um, and it brings its own challenges. And of course you have apps these days. So every, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things are happening on apps to basically guard the process. And you even have these uh, RFID readers that you can slot your phone into. Um, so uh, well, we're all uh, familiar with apps, I think. So this, this, uh, these things, these gener, uh, uh, these things generate the data, 
Um, but then the real journey uh, begins, and that is surviving some hostile conditions. Um, there's a whole bunch of problems uh, that mean that Alfred won't make it most of the time. So this is a picture of a factory. Um, I like this picture. It seems nicely co uh, color coordinated. I think the, the red pipes mean that they're hot. Um, and then you have the black on the bottom, looks very nice. Uh, but what you may notice is that there's a lot of metal here and metal is really bad for wireless signals. The RFID reader especially will have some, uh, some, uh, some big problems with it. So you have this structural interference going on. So Alfred can't even, well, in, in, for an RFID, RFID reader, he can't even be generated. Otherwise he won't make it uh, uh, to the internet at all. Um, signal interference is the same thing. These machines, they uh, they could generate uh, radio signals even unintentionally just by the way that they operate. So there's a lot of stuff going on that means that uh, uh, you will run into a lot of problems if you want to uh, carry a signal somewhere, even if it's not as uh, densely populated with metal is here, like a warehouse, you could already have these uh, these types of problems. So always when you want to start using uh, uh, IT technology, especially wireless IT technology in a factory, you have to think about this problem. The second part is the human element, actually. Um, and I say bad networking. Now, um, the problems that we encounter with uh, with this RFID reader are also, of course, inherent to Wi-Fi. So there's often a bad Wi-Fi connection, or sometimes there's not a Wi-Fi connection at all, or no internet access at all, because there are security concerns. Um, a good uh, rule of thumb to keep in mind is that IT usually for these manufacturing uh, companies is not their core business. Their core business is manufacturing the thing. We can make things more efficient. We can help them uh, maybe uh, make the process a little bit faster. Uh, but in the end, if the factory stops, um, the money stops. And as an anecdote, we've had this in the past where uh, a factory was hit by uh, malware, by uh, what's it called again? Well, basically all their computers were locked and uh, they couldn't use it. Uh, and that's because their IT security is no, was just uh, not up to spec. So well, always when you communicate with these customers and they're being difficult about their firewalls, there's no internet connection, keep in mind that this is there are some serious risks involved by doing your IT infrastructure incorrectly. So, you know, just be patient. Eventually, if you succeed to send your data out into the into the world, um, you still have to uh, usually have a short layover somewhere. There's, there's three different types that you have in general. You have the queue, the journal, and a database, um, give or take. Uh, and uh, I'll go into uh, into the details a little bit later. So. Uh, why doesn't the data directly sent to you? Well, uh, sometimes it, people can do this with these PLCs, but what we also often see is that the people that actually make manufacturing equipment or the people that make sensors, they uh, they don't only sell, sell, send you the, uh, sell you the sensor, but they also sell you uh, some kind of web service where you can see your data. So the data travels to this, uh, this hub uh, of data uh, before it can actually travel uh, somewhere else. And this can be a business decision, but it's, it's also quite practical, right? Because you can configure your sensors to send the data right uh, to, this, uh, to this thing. Um, and that makes our job a little bit more difficult because we need to know whether it's a queue journal or database. So why is that relevant, you might ask? Well, in the case of a queue, uh, measurements are basically given to that queue in order. Um, when we remove an item from the queue, we actually remove it from that machine. It does not exist anymore except what we did with it. So if we, uh, if we stored it somewhere and then the machine crashes and it's gone, it's gone forever. So you can get it back. Um, New items are always added to the back, so you always read the first one, uh, and you always, uh, and then you you go to the end. Uh, queuing systems are great, really quick. Um, they have low disk usage. Um, the only limitation is that well, if you lose things, you you really lose things. Uh, secondly, you have a journal. A journal is kind of the same uh, as a queue in the sense that stuff arrives in order and you, you pick the first item. New items are always added to the back, but when you read, it becomes a little bit different uh, in the sense that stuff is not actually deleted. So if you want a second chance, for instance, you save data wrongly, you can still go back in time. Uh, Azure Event Hubs, for instance, is, is one of these systems that, uh, that you can use. So then it's a little, a little bit less scary. 
but this data is not permanent. Eventually it will you know, get deleted as well. Uh, usually there is a retention time that says if the, if the message is older than a month, we will delete it. So uh, even in this case, you also have to uh, uh, keep in mind that the data will disappear uh, at some point. Uh, and then you can, of course, use the good old database, uh, also what uh, Mendix is built on. Um, the, adva the advantage here is that, well, you can basically add stuff uh, permanently and you can read from it per permanently. Um, the you can even read things out of order. Um, the problem, of course, is that, well, it's a little bit heavier when you start using it. So when you start storing a lot of data in it and recovering a lot of data from it, um, and it will blow up at some point because you cannot fit infinite data into database systems. And it depends a lot on the database system, whether it will fit or it will not fit. So um, the other ones are less scary, and this one is a bit more permanent. So. With all this data, what, uh, what are you going to do with it? What, where, where are you going to store it? Well, only a database is a true home. Uh, it's the only real uh, place where you can keep stuff permanently. And usually, that's what your customer wants. So if you're, uh, the layover was on a, a queue or a journal, then uh, make sure that you store this data. Um, Elasticsearch is not a database. Um, this is a bit of a, a thing that we have to repeat, um, and it might not make much sense to you, but if someone says, oh, we'll store it in Elasticsearch and it will be fine, no, it won't be. Just just remember this sentence. It's like, this sentence has served me well. Um, if you're using a third-party database, like I said, these services that uh, store data for you uh, ask about their retention time, because sometimes, uh, even though it is a database and they say they'll store it for you for a long uh, period of time, that period of time might not be long enough for, uh, for your use case. And don't try to change Alfred, please, also. It's very important. So when you have data, um, you should always try to keep the data intact the way it was sent to you. Um, what we see sometimes is that people transform the data or delete some data that they didn't need, um, and then only to discover that later on, uh, someone comes to you and says, hey, I found this, uh, this piece of data, or sorry, I found, I'm looking at the screen, I see something is wrong, and you threw away the original data, so you can't find out whether you did something wrong or whether actually the data was incorrect. Also, if you were wrong and the data was correct, then you can reread it, so you can uh, try again, basically. So it's always a good idea to try and keep the original data. What also happens a lot of times is that additional processes happen. So the business says, you know what? Uh, I want to calculate this new thing. If you have the original data there, you can just do additional processing. Um, what's probably the best thing about keeping the original data is let's say you screw up quite badly. And with the numbers I will show you later, we can screw up really badly sometimes. It's nice that you can just reprocess the data um, uh, even in, in such a case that the customer, you can just say, okay, everything is really bad now, but you know, in a day or two, everything is gonna be better. Um, so the, let's talk about the demise of Alfred, I suppose. Uh, keeping data is an, is an interesting topic as well. Um, it, in the end, this is a business decision. And uh, you might ask a customer, hey, um, how long should I keep this data for? They might even provide you with an answer, but always make sure to back it up with, oh, how, legally, how long are you uh, supposed to keep it as well? Because uh, sometimes those, those two answers differ. And of course, you know, law is, uh, uh, it takes precedence. If you do need to delete all data for technical research, you, your database just can't keep up. Keep in mind that it's often a, uh, uh, allowed to archive this data. The people that need all data are usually people that are, you know, investigating, uh, like doing uh, business intelligence queries or on it or something like that. So you can choose to put it in an S3 bucket or something, you, you know. Um, but always make sure to archive this old data then, rather than deleting it because of legal reasons or business reasons. So I gave Alfred a, a fancy hat because uh, so far we've only been talking about uh, Alfred as data, but actually we want to, to make Alfred information, right? In order for it to be uh, just in time information, we first need information. And this slide is gonna be short because this is what we do all the time, right? When we create a little screen and we show uh, the temperature in Celsius on it, or we see, hey, you're an American, let's make it Fahrenheit. Um, then in those cases, you are already um, transforming data into information. So that's nice. 
So what if we want to make it just-in-time information? So um, the, the way the just-in-time information we're most familiar with is on demand. These are the screens that we have. We can show measurements, we can show aggregations, we can show consolidations. Um, uh, these are ever increasing uh, uh, more complex ways of showing data, but when someone clicks it, they can look at it and they can view it. And you know, they clicked on it for a reason, they wanted to view it. So this is already, we're already partly there. Um, for the aggregations, so for you that are not familiar with an aggregation, when you look at one data point, uh, well, that's just a measurement. When you look at the group of data points uh, that are clumped together, like for instance, uh, you have measurements for every 10 seconds, but you only want to see the measurements for each month. So you add them all together. That's an aggregation. Usually that takes a bit longer. And if that would take something like 10 seconds, just uh, saying a random number, then it's not really just in time anymore. It's just a little bit too late. Um, so in those cases, you often want to uh, process this information beforehand. Consolidations are comparisons between aggregations. So it could become even worse that a query that could take I don't know, uh, 30 minutes to load. And then of course it's not just in time uh, information anymore. Reports, we uh, batches, I don't like batches. Uh, you know, I like to do everything real time. Um, so I'll talk about real time in a minute. Um, but actually when you think about it, batches sometimes make sense. Uh, there are people that work on quarterly reports. So when, uh, when they need information for these quarterly reports, it would be nice if an email was sent to them right when they need it, right? When, uh, to, to build this, uh, this report. Just don't go nuts with batches because, or, or reports because people will start ignoring them. So this is what I really wanted to talk about. And that's, uh, that's a bit of a fire there, you may notice. Um, and that's, this is actually about real-time data. Um, we had one customer and this customer had an asset and this asset was loaded to the brim with sensors. And it was, uh, they were also reading these sensors, storing all this data, it's all nice. And then one day it was on fire and it burned to the ground, even though it had many sensors on it. It probably knew that it was on fire. So what you really want in this case is real-time alerting. Um, preferably even before it is on fire, right? You, should, you want to know there is something wrong with this. There may be a short circuit uh, or some of the sensors don't work anymore. So anything, right? A, a little bit of a warning that something uh, something isn't, uh, isn't quite right. And if it is on fire, it would be nice to send an alert to the fire department right away uh, instead of having to deal, uh, instead of, uh, you know, panicking uh, at, uh, I don't know, six o'clock in the morning. So, that's just a whole other thing about data, making it information, um, uh, talking about just-in-time information. So how do we do this uh, at time series? So let's start with what we already know, right? We have our Mendix application where you want to show uh, to the customer well, what they want to see on demand. And we have the data that wants to travel our way. So. Uh, what you find uh, oftentimes in factories, these uh, PLCs, they like to communicate over a protocol called MQTT. Um, and the way that we deal with that is with RabbitMQ starts, uh, they can just send this information uh, right to this service. Uh, this service is a queue, by the way. Uh, what we do then is our microservices, we, we run everything in a microservice architecture. We read from these queues and we start storing it into Cassandra. Um, Cassandra is a database. And we store a lot of stuff in there. I'll, I'll get to some numbers uh, uh, in a bit. Um, you might wonder, oh, well, why doesn't Mendix run on Cassandra then? Cassandra is a bit of a dumb database. It's very good to store a lot of data into, um, but uh, it doesn't have relationships and things like that. So it's, uh, it's good at one thing, but uh, not good at, uh, at, a, at a whole bunch of other things. And I'll let you show, uh, I'll show you how good it is in a, in a couple of minutes. At this point, we can already expose uh, this data uh, via gateway to Mendix. Uh, it could read it, it could show this data uh, in, in screens, uh, and uh, you could even create your own information from it, right? You could say, oh, you're from America, here you go, you have Fahrenheit, right? Um, uh, so the on-demand part is already done here, um, but this is not very special, right? So let's move on to a little bit at how we create a little bit more of these uh, other forms of uh, just-in-time information. So for that, we use Kafka. So what our microservice architecture does, it's whenever it receives some data, it puts it on Kafka and other microservices read from that same Kafka. Um, and then uh, Kafka is a journal, by the way. Um, 
And then these microservices uh, refine these measurements, for instance, transform it to Fahrenheit. I don't know why you would do that, but it's a possibility. And then put it back on Kafka. Uh, other services can then read again from Kafka, uh, also transform that information, and you kind of get this loop of transformations going. What we can also do is already send these transformed messages back into Cassandra again, which means that automatically they become available at, uh, on the on the Mendix side. And of course, that 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 will all be uh, real time. So it's uh, uh, um, uh, so you can respond uh, on real time to events that are happening in the real world, uh, which are convenient because sometimes. For instance, when your asset is on fire, you might want to send one of these uh, events back to Mendix. So we send these uh, events back to Mendix and we can do the same with reports as well. All right. Um, we have a couple of other options available. So it's not just RabbitMQ. We can communicate with Kafka directly. We can communicate with the gateway directly. We have some Mendix customers that uh, send the data via Mendix to the system and then read it from the system again, just because uh, the data comes in really large volumes and they want this real-time events based on it. So, uh, all right, I've been talking about large numbers. What what did it actually mean? So we have one customer and it, it's our biggest customer. We like talking about our bigger customer. And they send about 300 million uh, measurements each day. This is an average. Sometimes it's a bit more, sometimes it's a bit less. We've seen a peak of 2 billion uh, once. I was actually I was making a screenshot for a different presentation, and that was one I saw that we processed 2 billion measurements in a day. It was quite a surprise. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing bad happened. Um, I wouldn't you know, put that kind of stress on the system all the time, but uh, it was, uh, it's nice for presentations like this. Uh, and history is never deleted. Well, I think you already see this coming, right? How much data is there? So we get about 300 million measurements uh, for uh, every day uh, for about 15 years for, uh, 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 well, that's it, right? So what does that amount to? That's about 1.6 trillion uh, measurements. Um, and now you might say, oh, why are you estimating this number? And why aren't you just asking Cassandra how many measurements are there? That's one of these things that this database is not good at. You can't ask how many measurements do you have? We have to estimate these kind of things. Um, yeah, so I thought it was a bit of an interesting uh, look at how we deal with big data over a time series. And then uh, I would like to uh, hand, uh, hand it over to, uh, to Rick. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. Um, let me see what I can share my screen. I'm still trying to get out. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> That's fine. I think you should be able to see my screen right now. Um, yeah, so basically, whenever we talk about things like data, architecture, um, sender data, those kind of things, then typically we see that we run into some kind of challenges. Maybe like it's going to be architecture. Sometimes it's going to be things like performance risks. Um, and that's why I really want to like talk about that as well. If we're going to be talking about solutions, yes, that's fine. Um, but it's also a little bit more complicated in terms of like Mendix modeling. And I think it's cool to actually show some of these things and explain you how we did solve some of these issues. And the first example that I always like to talk about is if we're going to be talking about more complicated applications, um, then it's good to not just talk about how you want your application to behave from a functional perspective, but also to really look into the things I like to call non-functionals. Um, and in this case, I had an app, an app that we were running for a specific customer. And for some random reason, we had to render it with like four nested list views. It was a little bit more of a complicated UI, um, but it was really a cool UI. We really wanted to keep those four nested list views in there uh, with a whole lot of like dynamic classes to render it in a cool way. And the easy way of a dynamic class is use a microflow. We saw it took like 10 seconds to render this page, which we didn't really were very happy with because like 10 seconds is a lot of time. Um, so our first action that we took to say, let's get this app to perform better is let's just persist some of this stuff. Let's pre-calculate it. And we use some nano flows. And like, that's already like the first lesson, be very careful with what you do in a microflow versus a nano flow because a microflow runs server side and a nano flow runs client side. So it gave me six seconds or like a factor two and a half. But then the PO said like, yeah, that works fine. 
but I want to support a thousand users. And I asked this PO, like, what do you mean with a thousand users? Are you talking about like named users, people that just have an account in the system? Are you talking about people that might log into the app like once a week? Are we talking about a thousand users that are running the app continuously, simultaneously, and concurrently? Like those are three very different concepts. Uh, but he said, I don't really know. I just want to have a thousand users. So I said, I'll just go for some testing. Um, because if you don't know what to do, just test your application. And what we typically see when we start to do things like performance testing, like testing how many users you can handle and whether it's going to be a thousand yes or no, um, we see these kind of hockey stick charts. Um, so initially, like the system gets slower from more or less like a linear, linear curve. Like it's easy to explain. Um, if you only have one user, like your, your process can run very, very fast. If you have two users or 10 users, well, you need to share computing power. So theoretically, it's still somewhat linear. But at some point, you're going to hit some kind of threshold. And you, that's where you see that the chart is going like in a vertical curve. Because at some point, your system is no longer capable of handling all these requests, which means that there's just going to be a backlog being generated. Um, it's a little bit like the hospitals that are yeah, just getting too much demand from COVID, COVID crisis. So what you really need to be careful with is where does this very much like ticking tipping point lie in my hockey stick chart? Because I don't really want to hit that. And I want my SLA to be like on the safe side of this thing. Um, and what we saw in this case with these four nested list views, like it's always a little bit of a tricky situation. And we saw that with already with 10 users, it made a difference between an app that worked and an app that didn't work. Um, so in my case, I would say like, I don't really have to clarify the concept of a thousand users because I just can't get it to work. So what we said then is, okay, maybe you should really like redesign the concept. And what we said is let's create a pluggable widget. It's very easy to create a very small little custom component in Mendex. Um, and it's gonna load all the data at once. And it's just gonna transform it in a bunch of nested diffs very much the same as for nested list views, um, but just very much quicker in terms of loading the data. And what we saw is with like this different way of loading the data, I could get my four seconds back to like 300 milliseconds for a single user, which made a whole lot of a difference because like this was the difference no longer between like whether the app worked or didn't work with 10 users, but I was confident to say to my PO, like your thousand users, whether it's gonna be thousand a week, a day, or like more or less in an hour, you're going to be fine. And it's just done handle this, like your load, like how you want it to do. And I think this really showed like, like two lessons. The first lesson is obviously like, make sure that you test your thing from a performance perspective. And secondly, sometimes you need to think a little bit outside that Mendix box to get the stuff to perform right. But because it was only like this very tiny pluggable widget, you can still utilize the whole powerful part of like the Mendix platform. Um, and another great example of this is if we're gonna be talking about like data points in a plotly chart where you would throw them as non-persistent objects to your client. At some point, it's just no longer gonna be very, very fast. And if you were to use like the any chart widget from the app store, you can create your JSON array already on the server side and just send that string to the client, which makes it much, much faster. Um, so yeah, like this is the thing I like to call non-functional requirements. Ben has already talked about it. Like how long do you want to keep your data? Um, if we're going to be talking about like getting the data, um, another great example would be like, like can this data flow be interrupted if I do a deploy, for instance? And I always say like, please investigate your non-functionals. If you're going to be developing applications for a factory, where things are very, very important, or if you're gonna be developing like IoT data where you wanna action on your data, you don't wanna miss a data point. Like it's gonna be important for the system to run properly. So I would always say like, look into the numbers, get some insight in users, how they're behaving concurrently, get some insight in the amount of data you're gonna keep. Is your Mendix app gonna be fine or do you need to store it somewhere else? Same when we're going to be talking about things like mobile. Uh, Dennis was talking about like internet connectivity for the sensors. 
Hi there, say it's the same for your client application that might be running on a mobile phone. Like, does it need to be online because you want to get all the data? Um, or does it need to be offline because the internet connection might not be very good? Um, sometimes you even need to think about network speed because, yeah, sometimes some, some of these factories are in remote areas. I've seen these cases in the US. Um, it could also be like screen size, device type. Um, I once had to add, build an app for like Windows Mobile, um, which had like very poor capacities, like just take into account that you can be limited by your platform. Um, I've seen customers that require things like screen readers because they have customers or users that might be like visually impaired. Concept like security. Um, are you going to be looking at internal users versus external users? Like how sensitive is the data and who can actually hack the system? Like we had the great meetup about security where we were talking about like the forget password module. Yeah, sure, that needs to be very, very safe. But sometimes developing an app that's a little bit more secure for your internal users that are already logged in can be like a little bit of a pain. So I asked my PO like, should I really care about security that much? And my PO said, well, if I hack the system from internally, I'll just invite them to join our development team. So don't worry too much about it because it's only gonna be an internal application. It's their own data that they're messing up. And then the same where like Dennis was talking about your business criticality. Like how often can you do deploys? Can you take the app down? Um, if something goes wrong, like what is your time to respond? So really take into account like those kind of things. Um, and what I see is when I look at Mendix apps, because it's so easy to bring business and IT together, um, it's very easy to focus on your features and to forget about like these more boring computer science like requirements. But I still would say like, you really need to think about it. Mendix takes away a whole lot of the challenges, but if you don't configure it right, it's still gonna be, yeah, not as good as it could be. And another great example where I see that we have a lot of challenges um, in our customer, customer applications is in the whole offline and synchronization part. Um, because it's like an extensive topic. It's not your typical Mendix application that's, yeah, like typically it's still online. Um, but Mendix can run offline and it can do great things for that. Um, and with Mendix 8, with like the whole React Native part, it's so extremely powerful and we love it in our factories because it now allows us to actually interact with hardware. Um, we literally install some React Native applications like Mendix applications on, for instance, Zebra scanner devices so we can interact with the APIs that, that are in there. Um, and the same with like RFID, we have um, RFID Bluetooth widgets that can actually like connect to these things. And with React Native, you can utilize the native part and combine it with low code to get applications very, very quickly. But yeah, then there's always going to be that performance challenge. If you're going to go offline, like the more objects that you have, the longer the download is going to take. So maybe you don't want to have like over a thousand objects because otherwise it's going to be a little bit challenging. Um, and what we see is like you get your apps, you get them up and running, everybody's happy. And then half a year down the line, you forgot to actually think about your historical data and it's being synced all the time and your app is slowing down. Um, just a little bit over time, but yeah, like at some point your app is just gonna crash because of this, because like all these requests are gonna be a little bit slower and then all these users are hitting the system at the same time and oh, then you're hitting your hockey stick curve again. And yeah, just sounds almost like kicking in the open door, but like images put the heavy burden on performance. Um, at some point I saw um, an application where by accident we were syncing fail documents um, and that combined with historic data um, made it like a very slow synchronization process, which you may not feel when you test it on your local device, but it's definitely gonna be a challenge if you have a customer with a lot of data, with a lot of historical images that you keep on syncing two ways. So they're just like some of these things that you really need to think about if you wanna think about performance and offline. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe you want to think about like how long your microflows are running because you want to get like a nice sync time. 
And another thing that I typically see that's not your typical Mendix case um, is what we can call like API design. Because like in this whole industrial space where there is like these backend databases like Redshift or like, like Azure databases, we start to use Mendix as a front-end tool on top of the data lakes, which is pretty cool because you can create applications and front-ends quite rapidly. Um, you can change them very easily. Um, and you can consume REST APIs very easily. Like that's what we promise from a Mendix perspective. But what we also know is that Mendix started out like back in the days. Um, yeah, like, like where we had like the database running inside the Mendix environment. So sometimes it's also a little bit challenging. So there's always like the pros and cons here. And I just want to show you some things um, because I'm pretty proud of like what you can actually do if we're talking about the data lake. So let me just show you like our IoT connector, the thing that Dennis was already talking about. And what we can see here is a Mendix application um, and this Mendix application doesn't have any data in it at all. Yeah, the only thing it has is like the endpoint of the IoT connector on the other side, um, but it doesn't store any data about like assets, measurements, those kind of things. Um, so what we have is like our IoT data lake that Dennis was talking about, where we have things like assets and boundaries. So we can say certain measurements have to be in specific values. We can access our data and our measurements, um, as well as some profiles and sensors. What you can see is like, they just have some information. I can grab it, I can post it, I can update it. Um, pretty cool. And with the IoT connector, Mendix application, we can visualize the data. And what we've done here is we said, okay, we create a Mendix module to actually connect to this, like a bunch of REST service consumptions uh, with like a nice domain model, as well as like a template application that you can use as a starter. Um, and we've seen that with customers, we can easily grab this template and well, use the charts that we like and just like throw the others out that we don't like. And you can see like, well, we plot the assets on the map because the assets are stored with a location. Um, and I can see like, like some boundary detections going on. Now, let me just like zoom into one of these, these, these assets. And what you can see here is data coming in, um, like how it came in over time. And I can see like my boundaries. Um, so like I'm gonna like hit boundary detection as soon as I go over this threshold of eight. Um, and this data is coming out of the IoT platform because I want my notification to be triggered like on that end and I don't want my Mendix app to be responsible for that because I just want to visualize the data from this end. And yeah, you can see like you can create some nice visualization. Um, I could also say I'm only interested in like aggregated data um, or I could say like, well, I'm interested in things like heat maps um, and it's going to show me this nice little chart um, or I can get like a bar chart. Basically, I can just like visualize my data here um, because that's what Mendix is very good at. Another thing that it's very good at is creating microflows. Um, so whenever like a boundary detection is hit, we say like, yeah, the notifications are very important like to do that on my data. And I can just literally like consume a REST API, um, say like, hey, we had a boundary detection for a specific asset for a specific channel with a specific value. And then with Mendix, we can, so easily say what we want to do with it. Do we want to send a signal back to an, to an asset or do we want to like send somebody a push notification or an email? Um, and what we've seen in the process of designing this is like if you build your APIs in a nice way, it's very easy to build a front end on top of it. But if your APIs are not, are not fit for purpose and you need to start doing things like, like joining them together, or like doing a whole lot of operations, it's going to be very, very challenging. So whenever you like run into the situation that you need to use Mendix as a front end tool, like don't shy away from it, but be very careful on like how you design the APIs. And like, it will be very cool to do that together with the people on the other end. So what I said, like Mendix is not always designed for using these non-persistent situations. And one of the things that might be a little bit harder there, and that's very important to think about, is the concept of what we call the dirty state, or like your non-persistent objects. Um, because what you can see is like non-persistent objects, 
they are in what we call the dirty state. Um, and that means they're not in the database, so they're just like in memory. And as long as they're in the dirty state, they'll stay there um, because you might need them in the future. It could be because there's a widget on the page that's using them, or it could be because they can re be retrieved somehow. Um, in case they can be retrieved from a persistent and committed object, like a user or a session, they will typically remain in state. And yeah, what I've seen where people actually tend to say, let's just link things to the current user or the current session because it's easy or some other non or like some other persistent object because we like it. Um, it might be that it's gonna be not cleaned because this mechanism is recursive. Um, so if I connect something to a user, like a user report, report line, report line details, um, it will be tied to that user, so it will not be removed. Which means if you keep on adding these things when you reopen the page, you're going to cause a memory leak. And this is going to cause a whole lot of performance issues. Because as soon as you use your, your Java actions for doing some cool things on the back end, Mendix doesn't really know what you're going to do with all the objects. So typically, it will literally send over the whole state from the front end to the back end. And that's going to slow down your request if you're not careful enough. There are some easy fixes in here that I'd just like to give to you. Um, for instance, if you don't really need your association, don't use it. So sometimes it's better to store things like IDs. So if you want to like create a whole bunch of non-persistent objects that are linked to an order, consider not associating them to the order, but to just store the order ID on your non-persistent object. Because you don't have an association, it will not stay in memory. Um, another solution is committing some objects, if you have too many. Uh, with a lot of our customers where we build like these cool non-persistent dashboards with all the factory data that's stored, for instance, in Redshift, eventually we said, how often does the data really change? So let's just use some caching on the Mendix end um, in the Postgres database, because I don't really have to keep everything in memory, but I keep everything in my Postgres database. And then just use things like a created date and a scheduled event to clean things up, because it's going to be much quicker. You can use native paging, you can use native searching. Um, it's cool. But it's also a little bit of a hack around if like, you didn't design your backend APIs properly, or when you just had to deal with what people gave to you. Um, so yeah, hash in the database. And another thing that you could use is to use like your control alt G to inspect the dirty state in the console. Um, because it will actually allow you to see whatever is in there. Um, and Mendix created some great blocks around this, like it's called the art of state. And it really like gives you an introduction in, in how this works. I could just show you like how this control alt G works. Um, let me just like to open up my network inspector here, hit a clear and click there. And I, now I'm doing like control alt D. And what you can see is it literally tells me like, hey, I got my char data, I got a char data helper, and I got, as I told, told you, like a non-persistent asset. So you can see everything in here is non-persistent. Um, and I can just like click on it and I can see like, hey, why do I have things open? Well, some things are like referenced by other things. Um, other things might be like on the page and some things are going to be garbage collected, which means like, well, they're still in memory, but as long as I will keep browsing around, they'll get lost eventually because nobody cares about it anymore. Um, so yeah, like this was more or less my presentation if we're, like, if we're talking about like the art of state performance challenges and like some examples of what we run into if we're gonna like deal with a little bit more of a complex architecture. Um, so yeah, Martin, I'm not sure what you wanna take it from here. Yeah, great, thanks, uh, Rick. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, so we're gonna go by them. Uh, so first up, uh, I got a question for Martin. Let's start with that one. Uh, what would be your number one go-to trick tactic to introduce your potential customers to the possibilities without overwhelming them? Well, that's a great question. Thank you, uh, Thijs. 
So it really depends also on who you, who you are, of course. If you're a medics consultant and you're in your day-to-day -day job, I wouldn't give them too big of a lecture and I would mainly uh, keep it in the back of your head and to know that you have a lot of knowledge, you know a lot of interesting Mendix reference cases, a lot of interesting widgets in the Mendix app store, and the customer doesn't know all of that. So I would really think about the pillars and how you can uh, use them to uh, make even more valuable solutions for your customers. So that as a managed consultant, and if you're talking more of a sales process, I would keep give a short introduction about the framework, about what is possible, and then I would make it really relevant to them. So let's say they they um, want a project management application. So what is the purpose of this application? For instance, to have um, uh, low cost, to have a cost effective cost effective project management tool, and then um, tell about a reference case of a customer. We we for instance had a customer who had a standard project management tool, and they didn't see all the right information at the right time and in the end this costs them over a million for for one project some projects really escalated because they didn't see the right information at the right time so then you can use the framework to tell them what is possible and how they can solve this i hope that answers the question and it wasn't really too long Marta. <laughs> yeah great thanks uh, thanks for time yeah, so we have, a, we have a lot more questions actually here. So let's get to the next one from Henry. Um, does this type of systems and big data create a lot of non-persistent data in Mendix? And how do you keep a good performance? So I'm guessing this is either one for Dennis or maybe for Rick. Yeah, I think it's probably a question for me. Yeah, it's, it's I think the question came in before like the second half of my presentation because like, we do have issues with it. Um, a great example, like like the the Plotly widget that I talked about, is that was one of the examples where I really run into issues. Where I said like I want to create um, measurements that pop up on the screen like out of the box, and let's just create them as non-persistent objects, and that that just didn't work. So eventually we had to change there for the any chart widget. Um, and typically, like if you Keep an eye on your state and, and be very cautious. It's going to be fine. Um, if not, you have to deal with like the other solutions, like hashing, using databases, or maybe use JSON to send things to the front end. Perfect. So, Henry, I hope that answers your question. If you have any follow up, please uh, let us know. Great. And then we've got another one from Jeroen Appel. It's, it's for Dennis, I think. Uh, it was with regards to the aggregated data. I was curious, is it also something you're probably storing in Sandra or is this something which is being processed in microservice for the Manix application itself? Well, like uh, many great questions, the answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, so all our uh, IoT endpoints already uh, come with aggregation uh, pre-built into the endpoint. You can say, I want uh, weekly measurements or monthly measurements, uh, because Cassandra is really good at doing that when you're looking at one asset. When you're looking at one asset, we can just basically do that in memory on the fly and then send the aggregated result directly to Mendix. When it gets more complicated, what usually happens is that uh, we uh, store uh, indeed a second measurement with some aggregated values in there. Uh, sometimes they do this on the Mendix side. Sometimes they, we do that on our side. It really depends a little bit. If it's if it's like really data oriented, you probably want to have it on our end because it's uh, it's data in the end. Uh, but uh, like visual things, I think is more happens on the on the on the Mendix side. So I, I hope that answers the the question. Yeah, it's, I, I would say it's also a little bit of like how it's going to be used. I've seen cases where we, for instance, want to um, create like searchable data grids and we really want to like compare these things, sort it, and then use like an expert button. Those are the cases where we would say, let's store the measurements on the on the Mendix end. Um, on the other hand, if we're going to be talking about like way too much data, um, like well, our biggest customer, for instance, then even the aggregates itself can already be like like way too much data to keep in a Mendix database. So we just like store it outside your traditional SQL Mendix database. Right. All right, thank you. So there's a couple more questions. 
So there's a question here from, uh, from Henry. How do you deal with dynamic lists of non-persistable, non-persistent entities? For example, real-time data from APIs. Slows down to performance. Uh, if you have those entities are not, if those entities are not garbage collected quickly. Do you have any tips for dealing with this except using a very fast, maybe in memory database? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I'm tempted to say, just like Dennis already said, like it depends. One of the things that makes it a little bit complicated is that from the front end, you want to go to the back end and then into your APIs and that you have that stream going up and down. Um, if you gotta be really, really fast in a factory-like situation, we might wanna do this the other way around, where we say like, we use something like a pusher or we use something like a custom WebSocket environment where we say we push data points from the backend to the front end. And the only thing that the front end has to do with nanoflows is actually plot that additional data point on the screen um, or like modify my JSON string and my any chart. So if it's really fast and you're really dealing with the issue that you don't want to like communicate back and forth, then yeah, you can't use your regular microflows and XPath to grab the data. You need to consider pusher, web sockets, those kind of things. But typically, typically if you design your stuff right and it doesn't have to be like appearing within half a second, you're gonna be fine with a microflow timer, a bunch of microflows. Perfect. Great, thank you. Uh, and then we got another one from Richard, Richard Adams for Rick. Uh, when you think of real life data and from Mendix 813 on, uh, you could use the web service functionality. Uh, you talked about a little bit. Have you tried it out? Um, I have done a proof of concept with it. Like I haven't done anything yet that is ready for production, but yes, we've done some proof of concepts actually like literally push non-persistent objects from the client or from the, the server to the front end. And it's pretty cool. Awesome. All right, we have one more question from Suhas Mehta. Uh, sorry if you've already covered this in earlier in your presentation, but what is the typical data sampling rate that you've dealt with using Mendix? Uh, is it seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds? Ico second way. <laughs> I think that's one for you, Dennis. Yeah, I can take this one. Well, you'd be surprised. Actually, most companies send data uh, like hourly or 15 minutely. The example that I showed you with the 300 million measurements a day, those are usually 15 minute or hourly level values. Um, also for some reason, well, okay, so that, that's like one side of the equation. That's like most the data, other data is real time. So that means that um, you, well, we get it in real uh, get it at in real time. So it could be a lot at, at once or like, I don't know, a, a couple thousand a second, or it could be just a few. It depends on the, whether it's rush hour or not, I suppose. Um, uh, the data self is stored in milliseconds in the database. It's not always pro provided in, in milliseconds. We can also store it even more granularly, but that doesn't really ever happen. Um, we do see that more, more and more customers are trying to use more real-time values too. And then for some reason, they uh, go to 10 second values. I don't know why, why that's a thing, but that, that's apparently a thing. So uh, I hope that uh, answers your uh, question. I guess a question that you, I'm sure you guys discuss with the customer as well is, do you really need the data real time, right? Um, because if they don't, then it's probably much easier to and more efficient to the, for the database and for the application itself to handle the data. Yeah. Um, what well, if you ask the customer how when when do you want to delete the data? In my experience, they always say, "No, we don't want to delete the data. We want to keep it forever." It's only when you come with the implications of keeping the data forever is when you start talking about throwing stuff away. Uh, what we what we do for the ten second value values, for instance, is that we get we get them ten second values, and then we can even I think we had a WebSocket application for that. I don't remember exactly. We could send it on uh, straight uh, to the uh, to Index. Uh, well, it's not a website. It doesn't matter. Um, and 
uh, they could see it at real time. And then under the hood, what we did is we collected everything in a bucket of, I think, I think 15 minutes uh, and then store it again, aggregate it as 15 minutes and throw away the data that we didn't need anymore. So that that's, 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 but it depends on the customers. So some customers, you know, they have all the money in the world and they, they're willing to pay for it. And others are like, well, this is getting a bit crazy. Right. So Suhas is giving us an update. Thank you for the answer to my early question. Um, I have one more question. How do you deal with the data that is compressed at the source? Have you had to deal with that data? We have, but usually I don't know what it means uh, compressed at the source. What we do see sometimes is that we get compressed measurements in, then we decompress them. But when you store them in Cassandra, they're compressed again anyway. So I don't know if that's like, uh, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and actually, okay. I think that we rarely get measurements in something like a JSON format. It's always some kind of like weird sim single, like either ASCII string or some weird register values. So there's always going to be like some kind of like untangling and like actually reading the measurements. Yeah. Even when they send you JSON, then you think it's JSON, but oh no, there's no commas. What's this? You know, stuff. So that happens all the time. Yeah. Great. Well, Suhas, if, if you have any follow-up questions, let us know. Um, I, I do see uh, one more question here from Matt and De Vries. I don't know if you, if you guys have any answers to this. It's a general question, just a random nice. question. What are you guys looking most, most looking forward to in Mendix 9? I, I saw the question popping up. Like, I think there are two things that are really like, like standing out for me. The first is the progressive web app, which I really like. Um, we use it in, in factories as well because it allows us to do like offline applications without having to go for native. Um, and I think that's very powerful because you can utilize like the more complicated pages um, as well as dealing with the offline challenges. We see some manufacturing companies actually use like, like Windows devices instead of Android tablets, for instance, it makes it very easy. Um, and the other thing that I'm looking forward to is the data hub, which actually um, allows us to like, like get the data flowing between AppSmart more easily. Um, and it's something that we like want to do a proof of concept with to connect it to our like IoT platform. And we see it popping up with MindSphere that it's going to make it so much easier to expose the data from like these data lakes and consume it in a Mendix application. I'm looking forward to that as well. So progressive web apps and data hub main two things for you yeah exactly so what about you dennis it's hard to say i don't really keep up to date with the mendix version so i'm sorry about that usually what i see is that uh, the other teams get really excited like our widget team is really excited uh, about new stuff i know i talk to rick uh, a lot about uh, more the technical things that he likes uh, but i can't really give you like a, a thing that uh, that, I, that i'm looking forward to i'm sorry <laughs> yeah so I'm going to ask you as well, Martijn, I know your camera's off, but uh, is there anything specific that you have that you're looking forward to in Mendix 9 or uh, that you want to see? Well, yeah, it might sound like uh, strange, but I hear quite, uh, at, at, at quite some deals now, the, the workflow, like the, that they want the workflow. And so yeah. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, so it will help me in some deals. Awesome. Workflow it is. All soon. Looking forward to that. Uh, so Martin, do you want to take the last question? I see it's a sort of a, a general question, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's for, uh, for Dennis. Uh, what's the main reason to keep place on, uh, some logic Mendix is, uh, outside Mendix's local platform is the Mendix limitations, performance costs? Yeah, I think it's mostly about uh, performance. So that means that well, it could be cost as well. It's uh, like every, <laughs> everything in technology, you have to make uh, make choices, right? Um, in general, what we see is that Mendix is more connected to the business itself. So uh, they can focus on creating the screens and the flows and, and the things that the business wants while we are more uh, in the basement connected to the data people, the sensor people, uh, these hubs and, and things like that. So we basically make sure that the flow of data works uh, the way that it wants to flow, if that makes sense. 
uh, and uh, then uh, Mendix can uh, look into that like process and decide which information is important for the business. Um, that's usually what it boils down to. Uh, that being said, there is like there are no strict rules. Sometimes something over flows over to our team. Sometimes uh, sometimes something flows over to the Mendix team. So that's that's a bit how it goes, I suppose. Okay, great. I think that's uh, all the questions, uh, Jan. That's right. So, uh, we're going to wrap up. That's it. Thank you guys so much for organizing the session and for these presentations. I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot of things myself that I didn't know before. And I thought we also had some really good questions from the audience. So thank you as well for asking those. Um, and if you have any further questions or if you want to continue the conversation with us, you can always join us on the Menix community Slack or on the Menix forum. And uh, you can always ask us anything. So uh, please fill out the feedback form after the session closes to let us know what you thought. And if you have any further ideas for future topics for meetups or anything you want to hear about or learn about, uh, that's going to help us make the sessions better because they are here for you. So uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And see you all next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See ya. Thank you all. Bye.